The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon, everyone. This is Andrew McGill from 12 Points. We're going to give it one minute and then we'll get started for those people coming in a little bit late. Thank you all for joining. Glad to have you. All right, well, we will get started here. Those of you who, uh, who who get on late or know people that are getting on late, we'll have a recording of this webinar that we will be sending out after the fact. Uh, so, started here. So, hello and welcome, everyone. This is our second educational webinar of September. For those of you who missed our webinar last week, we discussed student loans. If you need a the recording and you did not receive that, we'd be happy to send that over to you. As I said, for those of you who didn't hear, I'm your host, Andrew McGill. I'm a wealth advisor here at 12 Points. Uh, I may have met, met some of you at your office or maybe over the phone, but for those of you I have not met, uh, it's great to have you here and I look forward to eventually meeting you. Today, our topic our educational webinar is basics of financial planning and as part of today what we'll be going through any questions that you have you can put right in the question section of the webinar and we will be looking at those during the course of our time speaking with you and any other questions that you may have maybe you don't want to put in the chat you feel free to just send us an email um, today, I'm, jo I'm joined by Jeff King, who's a fellow colleague of mine, and not only is a fellow colleague, he's an, he's an awesome guy, and I will turn it over to him to introduce himself and get us going. Thank you, Andrew. I appreciate that vote of confidence. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm really uh, happy to have an opportunity to talk about one of my favorite topics, which is financial planning. I've been doing it around 18 years worth with several hundred families. And uh, it's a fascinating, I guess I'll, I'll nerd out for a second. It's a fascinating uh, pursuit. And um, we're here to, to give you just some basics to start you off on your, uh, on your way. So with no further ado, let's, let's go. So this is the, uh, the financial processing process wheel. And our objective is to give you, as I said, an overall view of kind of a basic elements of what a financial plan is. Um, and the important thing about planning is to keep in mind, it is not just a single one and done endeavor. It's not like we sit down, we get all the data, we come up with a plan and here, here's your plan, you're set for life. It's an iterative process. It's planning, it's not, it's not called financial plan. It, the output is a financial plan, but it's a living document. And uh, there's a great quote that floats around the industry uh, quoting Eisenhower, who was, of course, a Supreme Allied Force leader, World War II, five-star general. It, it, the paraphrasing it is, plans are useless, but planning is indispensable, which means the act of planning is ongoing and you make course corrections uh, along the way. So when we look at the wheel that you're seeing here, our, our initial process is we sit down and evaluate what's our client's current situation, what, what's happening. Um, are you single? Are you married? Do you have a family? Do you own a home? Do you have um, accounts that you invest with or not? What's your familiarity with it? Um, what do you feel about risk? Those are all things we try to get an idea about. Do you, how long is your timeline? Um, any commitments that you might have that you're trying to make? Uh, uh, that leads us into talking about goals. The, the point of planning and engaging in an investment management firm is not just about getting returns, it's about leveraging those resources that you have and will gain and growing them to support your goals. 
It's not just a race. It's it's a race with an objective. So to facilitate that, we ask you to give us some data, which consists of things like tax returns, statements of investments, insurance policies, uh, anything that's germane to your overall fiscal health. Uh, we, we like to get a look at that. And we go through what's called a discovery process where we sit down with you and talk about what not only what your just financial goals are, what's your kind of overall life plan look like? What's really important to you? Who's important to you? Who's in your community? Uh, who, who do you want to be in your community? Who do you want to be at the end of your plan? And we try to, so we take it, this is what we call a more holistic approach to how we do this. So we develop these recommendations with you. It's, again, there's some iterative uh, going back and forth till we agree that these make sense and you know, get by it and you agree to implement and once we implement and get our clients on board, we're going to do course correction monitoring. So this is what we agreed to try to achieve. How are we doing? What's changed in your life? And then go forward from there, make adjustments as needed. So while every plan is unique, there are common elements that are crucial to creating um, an actionable plan. So the, the presentation today tends to address the basic elements. And Andrew is going to address a key component in understanding your current financial position, which is budgeting. All right. Thank you, Jeff. And yes, yeah, so this is thank you for sharing the process. And we'll start talking about what are some of those basics that make up a financial plan. Uh, the first one, which can be like nails on a chalkboard for some people, is a budget. We call it a cash flow worksheet, call it whatever you want. Um, but this comes down to understanding where your money is going and not only where your money is going, what is coming in, what is going out and what is being saved. The most critical thing with a budget is just having awareness. It's having awareness of exactly where those dollars are going. And then we go to the next stage of figuring out, does that reflect what your priorities are? as well as your goals. The hardest part I would say with just budgets in general is just the act of sitting down and doing it. We talk with many clients that we hear all the different things of, I feel like our expenses are changing every single month. We just had our second child and I feel like one, one month we're spending a ton on diapers, the next we're, we're going on trips or we have this a bridal shower or something going on. What we recommend is just sitting down and figuring out what are your fixed expenses, doing your best with what are your variable expenses. And whether you are single or you are married or you have a partner, whatever it may be, just going through this exercise, not being too hard on yourself and just getting something down on paper. If a lot of times we hear from some people that they don't even know where to start. We have, we have our own sheet or Excel that we'd be more than happy to share with you if that is something that's getting in the way. So, so, so going into, into budgeting more in, in general, the whole point of budgeting, or one of the biggest points with budgeting, is putting all the cards on the table. Or some people might say all of the pieces of the board game out there. And what we recommend to folks is giving every dollar a job. All right. We talk about Bill Belichick always says, do your job. So having every dollar going towards something, whether it's savings, expenses, or debt. We find that folks that don't have a plan, that money somehow, we hear words like disappears. We don't know where that money goes. We feel like we make a lot. We got a, we just got a raise last month and I don't know where that extra money went. So sitting down and going through and identifying where that money goes is your first step when it comes to financial planning. And that $0 is, is effectively, you know, at the end of your, of the exercise going through a budget, you've done it right. And you basically said this, this goes here, this goes there again. We know it changes on a monthly basis, but the first step is awareness. So with that, I talked about 
once you've done that budget, you want to have awareness of not only where the dollars are going, but then you want to say to yourself, does where my money is going reflect my priorities as well as my goals? And Jeff's going to talk about that here on this next slide. So the important consideration here with budgeting is it's it's, it's not it's not an arbitrary exercise designed to be just restrictive. It, the the budget that you produce is in service of of a, a goal. So uh, to to go to Andrew's point, you just got to raise and you don't know where the money's going. But what if you got the raise and you go, okay? One of the things I got to really start worrying about right now or being concerned with fulfilling is. Uh, I'm going to skip Andrew from your newborn. Newborn's 16 years old and got college coming in two years. How how am I how am I going to fund that? What does that look like? So, uh, in the service of a goal, it makes budgeting a lot less onerous. You're not just you know, it's, you're just taking money uh, that you could be doing what you call it, quite fun things with only, uh, and now you can't do anything. No, nope. the object is to still have some fun, but to hit the priorities that you've got. So as responsible adults, uh, as we move through life, typically you accumulate more responsibilities, not less. That's not a hard and fast rule, but it's one that I, I've seen generally. Um, you you want to make sure that you take the time to, you, listen, we all have to work hard. That's just table stakes. But what we do with the fruits of our labors and how we direct it toward achieving our goals is absolutely critical. Is we have to not only earmark money towards specific goals, we got to then prioritize them. So if you're in a situation where there's some resource scarcity um, that says you can't hit all of your goals, that that kind of determines how you're going to prioritize things, and that's a very important discussion to have. The earlier, the better. Um, and and one of the things that has to happen even before uh, we start looking at any other goal is you need an emergency fund. So, Andrew, talk to me about that a bit. Absolutely. Um, emergency fund. I feel like not everyone knew about emergency fund until COVID happened. Um, COVID, at the start, some people lost their job. Some people were out of work, and they relied on, on emergency funds. Emergency fund is not the... Uh, the coolest thing, it's not like an investment account that a lot of people like to talk about. It is it is just something that needs to happen. Having that those reserves on the side available to you. Some people call this the rainy day fund. So what we recommend is having six to eight months of expenses saved for a dual income household and 12 months for someone that's single. And this is something that's super important to build up. A lot of people right away, a lot of people look to just pay down. They may have debt that they've accumulated over time. And they're, they say to us, you know what, should I just put all my money towards that? That may be the right play. However, let's just say the next day something happens with your car and you need more money. That money end up goes on the, ends up going on the credit card. And now you've just basically changed the name of your debt. You've taken that from maybe it goes from student loans to now you have credit card debt. So having a buffer on the side that helps you get through times where the what ifs happen is critically important. Now, a lot of people will, a lot of will ask us, should I only be saving in an emergency fund and don't be putting money into my retirement account? We'll talk about it in a bit, but the answer is no. Now, we talked about before budgeting. We want to make space for putting money. If you don't have an emergency fund set up, you want to make space for that. You want to make sure that there is money definitely going to this account while it's built up. And then once that account is built up, and we'll talk about that in the next couple slides, once it's built up, look to put, put some of that money that you're putting in an emergency fund elsewhere. So, Jeff, unless you have anything to add there, I will turn it back over to you. Yeah, no, I just wanted to just to, just not to make too fine a point on it. So, you know, Andrew was talking about basically the opportunity cost with money. Um, so, uh, and he did it in the, strictly in the debt context. But there's another context is when you when you establish a goal um, that you want to fulfill. If so, you have let's say you've got um, your ten thousand dollars in an emergency fund or twenty, whatever that is, 
and you have an emergency, but you've also got $50,000 in a retirement account or an investment account, we, we, you don't want to be forced to have to take money out of your investment accounts. So by having that emergency fund, that's, that's your, your safe harbor, if you will. So Andrew just brought up an example of what one goal is, and we view this as a, a foundational goal, retirement savings and retirement planning. And at the heart of any financial plan that, that I've done, and I thought, dare say Andrew's done, that there's a retirement component. And, and, it, and it's important. It, it's, it, it's, it's important because uh, society has changed. Uh, we are, as citizens, responsible for a secure retirement. Yes, we've got some Social Security coming to us, but there is some concern about the Social Security Trust Fund running out of money and how that's going to be handled. So it's on us to ensure that we can have an enjoyable retirement that, and maintain our lifestyle. Um, so back in the late 70s is when the actual legislation was passed to create 401ks, um, 403ds, or I think right around the same time. They started to get implemented in the early 80s. So today there's roughly eight and a half trillion dollars um, in these two types of plans. That's a, that's a large number. Uh, and as these have grown, you've seen pension plans kind of go away. It's very rare that you have companies that have pension plans. So that makes these plans, which are called defined contribution plans, that, that much more important. Um, I mean, and th there's a couple of things that, let's just talk about forward case, uh, you've got going for it. First of all, the money gets allocated um, and it goes in as pre-tax dollars. So that reduces your tax burden because you can potentially end up in a lower bracket and you have low, it comes off your adjusted gross income. So now we've got these um, allocations each month going in to your 401k. So that takes another piece of risk off the table. So you can't time the market. So by having investments go in every pay period, which could be twice a month, once a month, once a week, you're, you're taking some of the risk, a lot of the risk out of the market. At some point, you're, right now, we've seen the market correct dramatically, and you're buying assets that are on sale. They're cheaper. Next time, you may be buying assets that are a little more expensive. So over time, you're reducing the risk by doing that. The other piece of the puzzle that's really, really important is this graph kind of points to is about compounding. So the money goes in, you get the growth, then you get the growth of the asset, the accumulated asset on top of each other. It compounds each year. So you get uh, a pretty powerful effect. You can see that curve is like a parabola. It's very powerful. The other piece that you're looking at there is why you have to do it as early as possible. So we've got a, a person in, in at 21 years old who starts versus a person at 47. 21 year old has by the time they're in retirement $471,000 while somebody that waits till 47 to put that same $24,000 investment to work only has 60,000. That is a huge delta. So retirement assets are intended to protect your standard of living during retirement. Um, but I'm just going to talk about some other forms of protection. Thank you, Jeff. You're welcome. We'll switch the slide here. Um, so I, I spoke earlier about protection from the emergency fund uh, point of view. And one of the things I I did not mention, which I'll mention now, is that you want to make sure that, that that account is separate and distinct. And right now, there are accounts out there that are high-yield savings accounts. You can just kind of keep that money set aside and make sure that it's not commingled with any of your other accounts. And so, so that's on the emergency fund. The other type of protection from the what-ifs in life is insurance. Again, this isn't something that people typically like to discuss. How it, however, it is a necessary thing to have as part of a financial plan. Why is it so important to protect yourself? As Jeff discussed in the last slide, we talked about the future, and I'll just go back quickly. You've accumulated $471,000 just in this one example. When someone is early on in their career, they have not recognize all of that money. But what they're doing now is they are building up assets over time to eventually accumulate all of that money. What we want to make sure is in the event that you get sick 
whether you get hurt, whether you get injured, whether someone in your family, uh, maybe a partner, knock on wood, uh, passes away prematurely, we want to put insurance in place and protection in place to ensure, to use the same word, that that 471000 is still able to come into your family if, God forbid, any of those things I discussed happen. So there are different forms of insurance. So there, there is, we're talking life insurance. So this would be if someone were to pass away, a sum of money would come into your, into your family. There are different, there's many different types of insurance. There's term insurance, there's whole life insurance, there is universal life insurance. We're not going to go through any of that today. But typically what we see is when people are first starting out, they have term insurance. So that's set for a period of time, say for 20 years, which is typically the amount of time that someone will be building up those assets early on in their career. So there's a lot of potential for them and you are basically insuring that potential and making sure that that, that money comes into your family eventually. The next piece is disability. People typically don't normally look at disability. They they think that they would never get hurt or they would never get sick. But typically, just like just like it's similar to life insurance where it's your income stops with you being sick, hurt, or injured. And your ability to make money, some would argue, is your greatest asset. And disability insurance can protect you in the event that your income were to stop. The next one is health insurance. That's something that most companies will offer and if your company doesn't offer there are some other options out there but making sure that you you take a look at what your health insurance options are for your employer and you also take a look at should i be on the ppo plan or should i be on an hmo plan should i be on a high deductible plan and all of those things are things that you should be looking through and thinking about as you elect things like your benefits. The last one I have here is long-term care. For those of you who don't know what long-term care is, is this is for someone who's later, later on in life typically, they might come down with something like Alzheimer's where they are not able to do just the main functions of their life when they're older. And the insurance company will have money coming in to help you with those health expenses that will come with someone be sick sick later on in life. Now, what I will say is with any of these things, first make sure and and understand what your company is offering you. A lot of companies are doing a great job these days with videos that with videos and maybe it's one pagers on exactly what your benefits are. Make sure you're taking advantage of those things. Your company spent a lot of money to make sure that those are in place. And just make sure, making sure you're getting the most out of that. All of these, or except for health insurance, there are opportunities to augment your company benefits. And sometimes that works, that it's it makes sense for people to add that coverage. Sometimes it doesn't. But that is all part of a financial plan. Should you be doing it also through your company as well as doing something privately? So that's another piece of, of insurance. Now that covers it from the insurance point of view. But next, we're going to talk about other ways of protecting yourself, but through legal structure. And Jeff's going to talk you through that, unless, Jeff, you have anything to add here on the insurance space. No, I think you, you covered it really well. Uh, this, again, this is a, a huge, broad topic. There's things we could take that slide alone. We could probably spend a, an hour on. So um, we won't do that to you folks today, though. <laughs> Okay, so we'll move move on to estate planning. Sure. So, don't let the title necessarily scare you. Estate planning often implies people with massive wealth are doing estate planning. In, in the context of what we're talking about, is everyone at the very least needs a will. And these other structures that I'll talk about um, have their place. But the, the, it's important to understand why you need legal structures, why these things even exist and what they're going to do for you. The most important part about it, it's literally minimizing conflict upon your death. 
there's when people die intestate, which means they have no will and things get probated and nobody knows who's supposed to get who, who's best, who has best wishes, families can self-destruct fighting over assets. And it's a terrible, terrible thing. You have the grief of losing somebody and then you have, uh, you know, battles over, over physical assets. It's, it's, it's not something anybody should endure. So at the, at the very least, you want to work on having a will. It's important, and that you can spell out very specifically uh, how your assets are disposed of after you after you pass, and and pr protect your loved ones from having to deal with an awful lot of aggravation. So that that's the number one thing you have to think about here. Some of these other structures, revocable or irrevocable trusts, and power of attorney, healthcare. I'll, I'll explain a little bit that. So with a revocable or irrevocable trust, the trust is a vehicle. It's actually an entity on its own. Okay, it's got its own legal status, its own um, equivalent of a social security number, called an EIN. And this entity exists to allow you to have even more control over your disposition of your assets when you pass. So they're very powerful instruments. They're not just for the super rich, um, but you will have to spend, a, a, you know, probably about three to five thousand dollars put together a fairly simple. Um, revocable uh, trust. Irrevocable trusts are different in that they're designed to remove assets from an estate if there's a large estate to protect yourselves from um, the tax man. And again, this is a huge topic we can talk about. I'm happy to take anything offline. Um, you have our email addresses on the slides and you see that at the end. Uh, the, the two others that are there are also, are also kind of crucial. So a healthcare power of attorney or healthcare proxy, that allows you to have, it's technically called a medical directive. So you can control what happens if you're incapacitated. You can point someone who's your guardian, who's gonna make those decisions for you as power of attorney. But you can also spell out in that document that you, know, you do not wanna be resuscitated or you do. Um, and then a durable power of attorney gives broad powers over your your assets and effectively becomes you and you're enabling this person to make all decisions about you in the event that you're incapacitated. Um, that's a very powerful thing to hand off to somebody. So you have to make sure you do it the correct way and get uh, good guidance on that. So um, I'm not gonna, in the interest of time, we're at 1230. I think that takes us to our conclusion. Yes, absolutely. And and one thing I'll just add, Jeff, and like. The little time we have here is making sure if you're on this call and you have uh, older parents or you are parents with kids, making sure number one you're you're talking to your parents that they have have things like this, um, and number two perhaps it's it's your kids making sure that you have they have the right powers of attorneys. There's um, we're not here to scare you by any means, but there are stories of kids at college making sure that they have the right healthcare proxies in the in the event that they get sick or something like that at school. It's it's this is critically important. And the last thing I'll say on this note is we are not attorneys. We're not able to draft any of these documents, but we are more than happy to connect you with, a, with an attorney. Um, so with that, we don't have any questions in, let me just double check here. We don't have, uh, here we go. We might have one question here. Must have escaped, but Jill should be told. Okay, Mark had a question here. Bear with me for one second. Okay, is it possible to share this PowerPoint via email? Okay, yes, we can absolutely do that. Richard must have escaped the duel. Okay, thank you, thank you for that note, Mark. Um, so, if anyone has any specific questions that they want to speak to their own situation. Uh, we would be more than happy to sit down and speak with you about that. Otherwise, feel free to send us any questions you may have. Uh, we can answer those. This webinar will be recorded, and we'll be sending that out after. And we will be able to send out that mark. I'll make note, and we can shoot you over that, that PowerPoint. And uh, with that, thank you everyone for, for joining our webinar today.
and uh, have a great rest of your day. And we will hang out here in case there's any extra questions at the end. Sounds good. We have still have 13 attendees. If anyone has any questions, feel free to put them up here in the chat box. All right. Signing off here. Have a great day, all.